Good morning. So good to see all of you who are here this morning. Uh, I do wish that my wife could be here. Uh, she had a spinal fusion uh, at the end of May and is still taking things pretty slow. For the most part, what bothers her most is riding the car. And so um, we're moving tomorrow. She's already in Alabama where we're going and me and the truck are going tomorrow. Uh, so I hope that you will uh, understand her not being here. And as much as I wish you could meet her, I really wish you could miss meet Wesson. Uh, Wesson is two and a half and is a real pistol. Um, and he's named Wesson after Smith & Wesson, so I guess we were asking for him to be a handful. But I grew up in Marshall County, and I hope you don't hold that against me, but it was great to drive here and see so many things that I grew up seeing uh, as I was on my way here this morning. Thank you for the invitation to be here, uh, and I'm looking forward to our time together. As we think about everything going on in our world, do you ever just look at everything going on and just think to yourself or even say out loud that the world is just on fire right now. There's so much going wrong in the world. And I'm hesitant to even begin this way, but just to remind us one more time, that we're in the middle of a, a global pandemic. How many of you, by raise of hands, how many of you are sick and tired of coronavirus? I see a couple of you not being honest because I think we're all sick and tired of it by now. And I think we're coming from a few different places. I've talked to some people who are so scared for their health. They have major health considerations and their doctors have told them, if you get this, it could be the end. There are so many people who are worried, worried and rightly so because it's such a, a health issue concern for them and so they're scared and I understand that I talk to other people though who come from a totally different place when they say they're fed up with it they say I'm, I'm tired of people telling me what I have to do telling me that I have to wear something on my face that I have to get a shot and that's all I want to say about that but they see it as this is something that certain people have run with and have agendas and I'm tired of all of it and I just want the world to go back to normal. You know, I kind of sympathize with that too. But globally, 200 million people have had coronavirus and globally over 4 million people, as of what's been reported, have died from it. Our world is in a strange place right now. But then also, as of a couple weeks ago, Two Sundays ago, Afghanistan fell to the hands of the Taliban. And I know that this is such a terrible thing to hear, partly because so many of us know people who have gone over to try and help make the lives of other people better. And to see this nation fall back into the hands of evil people is a terrible thing because we've watched families sacrifice so much. For these other people. I remember after this happened, Sunday night, Hannah asked me, we were sitting on the couch watching TV, and Wesson was engrossed in whatever cartoons we were watching. And so we had a minute just to talk as adults without him paying much attention. Not that the two and a half year old really picks up on it. He doesn't like when we talk about serious things. She says, okay, what, what does this mean for us? You know, is, is this going to affect our immediate lives? I said, well, honey, as Christians, our brothers and sisters are going to be slaughtered at the hands of the Taliban. It's already been reported that the Taliban has begun executing people because they have Bibles on their cell phones. There are reports of other things that are being done to the women of that country now that these evil men are back in power. It's a terrible time. But even in our own country, we've seen great problems, great violence, riots, destruction, fires, terrible things going on in our own cities, our own streets. It's something we have to deal with in our own land. But if that's not enough, we even think about the 
growing sexual perversion in the world. And it's something that's infiltrated every place in our lives. We've begun to see this in our government and the way certain things are being pushed. We see it in our media all the time. We see it in our entertainment all the time. Things are being taught in our schools now that are related to these terrible things. Yes, you can even find some of it in children's books. How terrible is the world we live in? Do you ever look around and you just get depressed? And you say, is there even any hope left for us? How much more of this can we handle? But there is one thing that could change everything. All the problems that our world sees at this moment, this one thing could change all of that for the better. It could give peace, it could give hope, it could find reassurance for us. It could bring us the ability to sleep well at night. One thing, but only one thing, could change everything. As we think about what this one thing is today, I want us to think about the power of the gospel. The one thing that could remedy every broken thing in our world is not something that you or I or any smart person in our world has come up with. The one saving grace and hope for our people, for the nations of the world, for all the lost, but also the hope of the saved, is just one thing. And it's something that God has done. And it is good news. Our world is full of bad news. And you know that. And we hear bad news all the time. Every time we listen to the news, every time we listen to the radio, every time we talk to our friends, always there can be bad news found. But the gospel is inherently good news. And it is the one thing that could change everything in our world. If you have your Bibles, let's turn over to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. I want you to notice that this gospel, this good news, this wasn't something that is a recent discovery. It's not something that just now are we saying, oh, well, we finally found good news. God's plan for good news and the gospel has always, always been there. What Paul tells us in Ephesians 1, starting in verse 3, is that the gospel was not a contingency plan. It, it wasn't a backup. It wasn't a safeguard But before the beginning of the world, before anything was created, God had a plan for there to be good, redeeming news in our world. Let's read these verses together. Ephesians 1, starting in verse 3. Paul writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, Sometime if you want a rich, incredible study about what it means to be a Christian, find a concordance or, or even you could probably find a list online. But just find that little phrase, in Christ, and read about it in Scripture. See what the New Testament has to say about what it means to be in Christ, what the blessings and the hope are when you're in Christ. But Paul says that there are great blessings to be found in Christ. Verse 4, he says, Even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blemish before Him in love, having foreordained us unto adoption as sons through Jesus Christ unto Himself, according to the good pleasure of whose will? Who is He talking about here when He says His will? It's according to God's will. To the praise of of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed upon us in the Beloved. 
Now there are a lot of people who when they read this, they see this word foreordained or, or some translations even say predestined. And they say, wait a minute, are you saying that God chose before the foundation of the worlds who could be saved and he has numbered us off? You can be saved, but not you. You can be saved, but not you. And they say, well, what kind of system is this if God has already destined who will be saved? But that's not what Paul's talking about here. In, in no way is Paul trying to give the hint that God predetermined that some will be saved specifically who they are and there are some who will be lost specifically who they are. What Paul's talking about here is that before the foundations of the world, before the first day of creation, God said, I have a plan through my Son. I have destined a plan so that people who follow the gospel plan they'll be saved. It's not that he has chosen individually, but God landed and said, this is the plan, this is the only plan by which people can be saved. And just because God has said, this is the plan, doesn't mean that people have to follow it. There are some people when they talk about salvation, they say that, that people are either saved or they're not. And really, it's, it's not up to them, but God has unconditionally called certain people to salvation, and, and it's something they can't even get away from. That's not true. Let me say again, that's not true. God made a plan for salvation from the very beginning, before the beginning. But He made a lot of other plans too. This is a true or false question. It is true that God has a plan that all of us should live in honesty, that we speak honestly. Is that true or false? This is Bible class, you can answer out loud. Yeah, of course that's true. That's God's plan that you and I be honest. Does that mean I can't tell a lie? No, of course not. Just because God's plan says something doesn't mean I don't have a choice in the matter. True or false? God had a plan from the very beginning when he created man and woman that we would choose to be faithful in our marriage and we would be sexually pure people when we went into marriage. Is that true or false? Yeah, that's absolutely true. Does that mean that you and I can't do things that make us sexually impure before we're married? No. God's plan is for one thing, but you and I, we can mess it up. We don't have to play by God's rules because God has given us the ability to make our own choices in life. The gospel, the good news about Jesus and what he has done, the saving power that has been set up before the foundations of the world, when God said, this is how people will be blessed, this is how they will come into union with me after they have departed because of their sins. God had a plan, and He has foreordained that plan. This is the way. And folks, this is the only way. You remember what Peter says when he's talking to the council in Acts chapter 4, verse 12? He says, there is how many names under heaven by which we can be saved? Is it just one? You know, that's not popular today, is it? There are a lot of people who say, well, there are all sorts of people, they all believe differently, and we'll get into that in the sermon this morning. There are all sorts of religions out there, and they all have a path to salvation. But God says there is one way. There is one name under heaven by which we can be saved. Jesus is the only plan. When we say that this one thing could change everything, it's not that there are options on the table and we get to pick which one we want. There's one way we can be saved. There's one way our neighbors and our family and our co-workers and our enemies and our friends, there's only one way we can be saved. And it was through a plan that God ordained before He began creation. 
as we continue with we'll think about Matthew chapter 1. In, in a sense, in Matthew 1, 1, we, we read that these are the generations, this is the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. In a sense, it's true that the Old Testament is just the storyline. This is how we got to Matthew 1, 1, where we have the genealogy of our Lord and our Savior. Matthew introduces him as Jesus Christ. This word Christ is connected with the word Messiah. That's the Hebrew word by which they talked about the one who is coming, who is anointed by God. He was the one that was going to save them. And the Old Testament tells us all we need to know to see, okay, from the beginning. In the very beginning, God created a perfect world. Can you imagine a world without any of those things we began with this morning? There is no sickness, there is no dying, there is no violence, there is no wrong anywhere. It can't be found. Everything, day by day, God looked at what He created and He says it is good. At the very end when He's finished... He looks at all of his combined work and what does he say? It is, it is very good. And then immediately in chapter 3, we see that we have already departed from God's right plan. God made everything perfect and the first thing that we really did was we messed up the perfect. And so from that moment, we begin to see a line of people by which our Savior is going to come into the world. He's the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the Anointed One. He is the One that's coming, that God is sending to save His people. The good news of the Gospel is so very, very important. But one thing that we learn in the New Testament once we see that Jesus is the, the only one coming to save us, what we see is that salvation is very urgent. What we learn in the New Testament is that salvation isn't something you prolong. It's not something that you, you put off and say, well, someday I'll choose to do this. The model that's set for us in the book of Acts is that there is no time to waste when souls are at stake. You realize that in the book of Acts, we read about people who hear the gospel and immediately say, I need to respond to good news. Have you yourself, or maybe somebody you know, have they put this off? And they say, well, there will probably be a time in my life where all the stars will align for me and it'll be the right time to give my life over to God and be saved. Have you heard people talk like that? The biblical model that we see from the infant church is that there is no time to waste. As we think about some of these conversion stories, I want you to follow along and, and think about this, the urgency that we find in the gospel. If the gospel is our only saving grace, and it is, if that's true, why would we waste time telling good news, life-saving news, grace-granting news? Folks, if the world is on fire, they need this. If the world is dying and going to hell, they need this. Think with me about the story at Pentecost. What this scene looks like. It's Acts chapter 2 and we'll begin in verse 36. Peter's preaching at the end. He says, let all the house of Israel know, therefore, let all the house of Israel therefore know assuredly that God had made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus Christ. Whom ye crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, Repent ye and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, unto the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For to you is the promise, and to your children, and to all who are afar off. Those who are afar off, that's me and you today. This is everybody we know. We are the ones who are far off. He says, even as many as the Lord our God shall call unto him. And again, those that he calls unto him, this is everybody. 
God's not only knocking on some doors asking if they want to be saved. This call for salvation goes to all people. Verse 40 says, And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. They then, uh, they then that received the word were baptized, and there were added unto them that day about 3,000 souls. You see, what I see at Pentecost is people who hear the gospel message, they're convinced of what they need to do, they're pricked in their heart, they have this movement within them, and they say, okay, well, there's some duty that I have because I know what I ought to do to be saved. And they don't wait until Baptism Sunday. They don't wait until they've saved up enough to, to make it worth it. They don't put it off in their personal lives and say, you know, I've got a lot to think about about this. They hear good news, and they see the bad news that's in their lives. They are the ones. They are the ones who killed Jesus. They crucified Him. They killed the Messiah, the one the Jews were supposed to be in anticipation of. And instead of rejoicing at His coming, they crucified Him. They see their own fault. They say, we need to obey the gospel. And immediately they go and 3,000 are baptized. We continue and we think about the Ethiopian eunuch. What his interaction with Philip looks like in Acts chapter 8. As we think about this, Philip is placed by the Holy Spirit along this road that the eunuch is traveling on. And he stops, is picked up in the chariot. And what's the first thing he asks? Do you remember? Somebody say it loud. I know that you know this. What's the first thing he says? All right. Do you understand what you're reading? He sees him reading scripture and he says, do, do you know what you're reading? He was reading from Isaiah. He says, I don't know who this is talking about. And from that moment, what does he preach to him? Jesus. Thank you, sir. He preaches Jesus to him. He doesn't talk about anything else because first and foremost, he says, you're not saved. And in order for you to be saved, you've got to hear the gospel. So starting in Isaiah, he says, I want to show you who this is talking about. He explains Jesus to him. And as they're riding along this road, the eunuch says, Philip doesn't say, you know, look over there. Would you ever think about doing this? He's explained this well enough that the eunuch, when he sees water, he says, look, there's water. What would, what would stop me from being baptized? Philip says, if you believe, then you can. They both get out. They go down into the water. He's baptized. He goes on his way rejoicing. He doesn't wait. He doesn't delay because he knows his soul is at stake. And that demands a response. In Acts chapter 9, we read about Saul, the persecutor. He's on his way to persecute more Christians, and the Lord stops him. And ultimately, when he goes and meets Ananias, what was the first order of business? Was it for him to regain his sight? No, the first order of business was for Ananias to say, you need to understand who Jesus is, because you have persecuted his people. And when he understands... He regains his sight and he's baptized. There's nothing that needed to stop Saul from putting on Christ and obeying the gospel. There's urgency in that. In Acts chapter 10, we, we read about how Peter and Cornelius meet up and, and how the Holy Spirit has orchestrated this. And as Peter is teaching, he realizes the Holy Spirit falls on these Gentile people. It's the first time that non-Jews are exposed to the gospel. And ultimately, what, what does Peter say? Who would withhold water for baptizing these people on whom the Holy Spirit's fallen? He says that because there's urgency in obeying the gospel. In Acts chapter 16, we read about Lydia, and we, we see that they have gone and, and they want to find people who are going to be receptive to the gospel message. Pick up with me in Acts 16, beginning in verse 13. It says, And on the Sabbath day we went forth without the gate by a riverside where we were supposed that there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spake unto the woman that 
were come together. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, one who worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened to give heed unto these things which were spoken by Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. She hears the gospel and she says, well, well, that's not something I can wait on. I, I can't wait to see what pans out about that. This is something I have to make a decision on right now. Later in the chapter, we read about the conversion of the whole family of this Philippian jailer. And again, we see how urgent it is that they choose that night, in the middle of the night, to be baptized so that they could be saved. There's urgency in the gospel. And what we learn from the infant church is the gospel can't wait. It's not something we sit on. We don't wait as Christians for a better day to tell our friends good news. There's urgency in the gospel. And if you and I know people who are lost, and I'm guessing we do, we can't wait. We can't put off. We, we can't say, I, I wonder, though, what would happen? What would happen if they don't believe? What would happen if I, I talked to them about what I firmly believe in my own life? How would I feel if they shut me down? Christians, we need boldness to truly believe that there's urgency in the gospel. And that means we don't wait. We don't ponder. We share good news. And so there are some things that you and I need to do because we believe that souls are at stake. The first is that you and I, we need to live right in our own lives. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul begins talking about what it means for us to live in a fallen world. And unfortunately, we have kind of, kind of gotten this wrong in a lot of ways. We, we judge the world and, and we look at the world with such disdain because they live the way they do. And I understand they live opposed to God. I get that. But what Paul makes clear, because God has directed to make clear to us, is that lost people are going to behave in lost people ways. Do you know what that means? Lost people are going to live like lost people would because they're lost. If you don't know who God is, you're not going to live in ways that honor Him. But Paul here makes an important, important point for you and me. He says, our duty as Christians is for us to live right before God. We can't get caught up in what the world does. You and I need to hold each other accountable because we're saved. We're God's people. And we have to behave that way. I want you to read these verses with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 9. I wrote unto you in my epistle to have no company with fornicators, not at all meaning with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetousness, the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. You realize what he's already been talking about in chapter 5? Remember he talks about a young man who's having an affair with his stepmother? He says, look, the world is going to behave in crazy ways because they don't know God and they don't respect God. But when I say don't be around and don't keep company with sexually immoral people, I'm not talking about them out there. He says, I'm talking about you. I'm talking about you keeping company with this man that evidently is having a well-known affair. He says, that's who I'm talking about. He says, if, if God wanted you to really not keep company with bad people who are in the world, you'd have to get out of the world. He says, on the other hand, this is what I'm talking about. Pick up with me in verse 11. He says, but as it is, I wrote unto you not to keep company. If any man that is named a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner with such a one, no, not to eat. For what do we have, uh, for what have I to do with judging them that are without, that's people without the church. 
people outside the church? Do ye judge them that are within? But them that are without God judgeth. Put away the wicked man from among yourselves. Paul says, church, we have to keep ourselves accountable. We have to hold ourselves to God's standards. Even when the need arises to practice church discipline. Because we take our identity as God's people very seriously. And we don't want to stain the name of Christ. The second thing that you and I desperately need to do is we need to spread the gospel. If you have good news, how hard do you work to tell good news? Let me ask this. When you have a grandbaby, and I'm assuming that some of you probably are grandparents, are you ashamed to tell people that you have a new grandbaby? Of course you are. You don't want anybody to know that you have a new precious bundle of joy in the family. I mean, you don't post about it on Facebook. You don't tell people. You don't smile at the baby because you're ashamed of good news. No, on the other hand, I've been around enough grandparents to know that they obnoxiously want you to know that they've got a new grandbaby. And they, all they want to talk about is this new grandchild. And they want to show you pictures and they want to tell you the stories and Oh, they're so excited because they have good news. Do you remember when you were high school graduates? Did you mail out a bunch of invitations to let people know that you were graduating from high school? You were beginning a new chapter of life. You're going to be seen as an adult now. Yeah, we celebrate because we're passionate about good news. Christians, if we are passionate about the gospel as good news, we will share good news. Romans chapter 10, Paul talks about what it means, the importance for us to hear so that we can believe. Because if we believe, then we can confess. He says, by believing and by confessing, we are saved. But then in verse 14, he gives some responsibility to the Christians he's writing to. And as you and I read these words today, this responsibility is now on our shoulders. Listen to verse 14, Romans chapter 10. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? Even as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that bring glad tidings of good things. But I want you to remember that as he talks about a preacher and and how then will they preach, he's not only talking about people who stand somewhere like this and they preach sermons on Sunday. He is not limiting the proclamation of the gospel to just people who are on staff at the church. He's talking about us. How will we tell people? How will they believe if we have not shared? Will will the church be diminished if the church doesn't get serious about the gospel? It's going to hurt the church if we as the church don't take sharing the good news about Jesus seriously. And I know that we love the church. You probably wouldn't be in Sunday school if you didn't love the church. If you love the church and you want what's best for the church, we have to share the gospel to lost people. Because that's the only thing that can help them. Here's number three. The the third thing is that we can't be ashamed of the gospel. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Honestly, we could probably quote this together, but we'll read it together instead. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I think, I think that at this moment, 
we need to read that first line of verse 16 over and over again until it gets deep down in our hearts. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. But he even gives us why we ought not be ashamed of the gospel. He says it's the power of God for salvation, whoever believes it. There's great power in the gospel. But it's not our power, it's not our church's power, it's God's power. And because it's related to the power of God himself, you and I have no reason to be ashamed of the gospel. Let me tell you why this is so important. It's because our world fundamentally knows that shame silences people. Have you ever thought about this? You, you go back to middle school and think about a bully. A bully knows that if he ashames you and he embarrasses you, he will always have a grip over you and you're not going to stand up to him. You're not going to tell anybody because you're ashamed. The world knows if they can make us feel shame over what we believe, we won't share it. The world knows that if they can make us be ashamed of the gospel, we won't talk about it. Have you ever heard things like, you can't seriously believe that? Have you ever had a conversation with someone and, and somehow it gets around to creation and, and you say, well, I, I do believe what Genesis 1 and 2 talks about and how God has created the world in seven days. They look and they squint and they say, you can't seriously believe that. I mean, science has proved. But please remember, good science always, always tells the truth. And good science points to creation and not evolution. But they say, can you seriously believe that? Whether they mean to or not, what does that statement do? It is supposed to cause you some embarrassment. Do you seriously believe that? You can't be serious. You can't be logical and believe what you say you believe. They know that if you are ashamed, you won't talk about what you believe. And it's gotten to the point today where they know that even name-calling, name-calling is powerful. We, we grew up saying that sticks and stones may break my bones, but world, uh, words will not, never hurt me. Well, it's garbage. The world knows that if they call us names, then we will be quiet. You take a stand against homosexual marriage, and they say, stop being homophobic. And if you won't stop, at least be quiet. You, you don't believe that gender is fluid. You believe there are two genders and you and I don't get to pick what that is and that if you are one gender, you can't just become another one. They say don't be transphobic and if you won't stop believing that, at least be quiet. You believe that there is only one God and His name is all the names of Scripture. And you believe that every other religion can't be right because... The Bible is correct. Don't be Islamophobic. You're just scared because they're not like you and they're different and they're from a different place in the world and you're just being bigoted and you're just being closed-minded. The world knows if they shame us, then we will be silent. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Because it's the power of God for salvation for every single person that believes in Him. There is no reason. There's no reason to be ashamed of the gospel. One last thought. We think about how this one thing, the gospel, has the power to change everything. Everything can be different if people believe in Jesus. There's a lot of problem in the world. There's a lot of hurt. 
there's a lot of sadness and remorse. The world is all sorts of messed up. But what you and I understand is that the gospel is the only hope of the world. And if you and I really believe that, if we really believe that, what will we do? If that's true, the ball is in our court. What will we do with the gospel? Should I close with a prayer? I, I should have asked that before. Uh, let's, let's close with a prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for today and we're thankful for every opportunity we have to meet together with our brothers and our sisters. Father, we're thankful for the gospel, for your plan to save the world from all of its own terrible decisions. Father, help us to love you enough, to love Jesus enough, to love your plan enough that we will share it in our lives with those who desperately need it. Father, we pray for boldness. We pray for courage. But Father, we pray that our eyes will always be on sharing your will with others. Father, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray this prayer. Amen.